This is a production of Cornell University. In the second decade of life, young adults have endless choices. The decisions they make depend on developing the power of the brain to learn and reason. In a Chats in the Stacks book talk at Mann Library, Cornell Professor of Human Development and Psychology, Dr. Valerie Reyna, introduces her new book, The Adolescent Brain, Learning, Reasoning, and Decision-Making. Bringing together an interdisciplinary group of leading scientists, the volume examines how the adolescent brain develops and how this development impacts various aspects of reasoning and decision-making, from the use and function of memory and representation to judgment, mathematical problem-solving, and the construction of meaning. Uh, my name is Alan Mathios. I'm the uh, Dean of the College of Human Ecology, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this event. Um, first of all, Mann Library is pleased to offer this book as part of their series, Chat in the Stacks. Um, and we hope that you'll join us next for the next chat on March 8th, a week from today, with Pierre Pritzep Anderson from the College of Ag and Life Sciences and the Division of Nutritional Sciences. He will talk about his new book, Food Policy for Developing Countries. Um, podcasts of all these chats are, are available, so if you go to the schedule and look at other talks, really, it's, they are very interesting, and you can find them and, and download them and, and watch them at your leisure. Um, these talks are also supported by the Mary Morrison Public Education Fund at Mann Library. Um, if you're interested, after hearing about the adolescent braid, in purchasing the book, the book is available here and at the Cornell store. And finally, there are refreshments which you can have throughout, throughout the talk. Um, but it is my great pleasure to introduce Valerie Reyna to you. Um, Valerie um, is, we work very closely together, and she is a professor of human development and psychology at Cornell University. She's co-director, the new co-director, of the Cornell University Magnetic Resonance Imaging Facility, um, which is a, um, a major um, MRI, fMRI magnet that is being constructed as we speak in, in human ecology, in MVR Hall, that will really open up the doors for a whole new set of research questions we can address by merging the biological sciences and the social sciences in ways that it's been difficult to do on this campus. So we're very excited about this. This is a joint um, effort. The other co-director is Yi Wang, a physicist who's coming up from the medical college in, in New York City to move to Ithaca to help co-direct this center. So it's a very exciting development for the whole university. Um, Valerie is also co-director of the Center for Behavioral Economics and Decision Research and also has been very involved in this, this ISS project on, on decision making um, throughout the university. So it's, a, it's another um, sign of Valerie's reach across colleges, not only contributing to human ecology, but really to the university as a whole. Valerie has um, done a lot of wor work on a whole host of issues, and I could spend the whole time talking about that, but I'll just mention that she's a developer of fuzzy trace theory. And this is a theory of memory, judgment, and decision making that has been widely applied in law, medicine, and public health, and is a building block for her model of adolescent risky decision making detailed in chapter 13 of the book. She's published widely around this um, is issue of how adolescents make decisions about risk and um, as a college campus with people who are, in it, are making many, many risk decisions, it has a lot of application to, to our current um, student population though they're not quite adolescents, it's moved beyond that, but there's a lot of um, evidence about human development that we, that it's not just an adolescent to something else, but it's a continuous development. So these issues of risk, decision making, is really profoundly important for, for throughout the life course. Um, what I'll say um, also about Valerie, and this is sort of not off the notes, but having observed Valerie, if you go down to her lab, there are always, I often find her, her office filled with people, but she's not there. And who's in her office? It's graduate students and undergraduate students working as teams, working on research projects. And one of the items, one of the major elements of the university strategic plan 
is to actually better integrate undergraduate education with the research mission of the university. And I think no one, no one really that I could think of does it better than Valerie. It, it's all integrated, the, the, the amount of mentorship, student learning that goes on, by, both by the graduate students, by the undergrads, by Valerie, by interacting with them is really amazing to watch. And what you see happen in this team building is students not only learn about the content, they learn about leadership, they learn about the whole process of discovering knowledge and moving them in some way from a consumer of knowledge um, to a producer of knowledge. And watching that happen is, is phenomenal. And Valerie has really mastered that. So I really want to thank her as a dean who cares so much about the education experience for students. It's, it's a great, great thing to watch. And I, and I know how much work it is. Um, so without further ado, again, you're, you're, you're seeing one of the stars of the university here. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Valerie to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turn that off. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this afternoon. I, I first want to thank the dean for that very kind introduction. Thank you so much. And uh, he and Kay Orbendorf have been instrumental in the development of this work on campus. So I want to be able to th uh, thank him not only for his kind remarks about me, but for his leadership as well, and Kay Orbendorf, who's been pivotal in this. I also, before I go on, I'd like uh, if the students in my lab would just wave so people could see. Jonathan, you have to, you know, <laughs> don't pretend not to know me now. Okay. <laughs> And also, I want to point out um, Christina Chick over there, who is the first author of that chapter in the adolescent brain. Any of the hard questions, she can answer for you. <laughs> All right, so um, without further ado, why write a book? Well, of course, the first reason to write a book if you're a professor is we like to pontificate. So we, any excuse to talk about our work, we will, we will, of course, take. But there were reasons other than that to write this particular book. And surprisingly, this is the first book that links higher cognition to the adolescent brain. In fact, many leading theorists and researchers in this area would tell you that cognition doesn't even develop much in adolescence, from adolescence to adulthood. That in fact, and this is a couple of years old, these ideas, only a couple, the assumption was that pretty much the information, information processing architecture was completely established by the time you got to be middle to late adolescence. But we've discovered since then that not only is there substantial development in the adolescent brain and substantial development in cognitive development, but um, that in fact has all kinds of influences on important life outcomes. So this research is so new that the field of adolescence itself, not even bringing to account cognition or the brain, even the field of adolescence itself is barely out of adolescence. The Society for Research in Adolescence is about, oh, 27, 28 years old. Um, and so this may seem like, of course, this work could, must have been done by many people. There may be, there's sh surely there are many books on the adolescent brain and higher cognition. But in fact, there aren't. This is the first one. Now, the span of research covered in, in the book is quite broad. It includes not only cognition or thinking, but also emotion and how it relates to life outcomes, health outcomes, but also educational outcomes. One of the things I, like, I feel very good about in the book is that the, the authors of the chapters are researchers. These are working scientists. This is based not just on anecdote and opinion, but it's based on evidence. And uh, they had uh, a really mean editor who uh, ensured that everything that was said really could be linked to evidence. And to, so, that, so rather than just be an, an opinion pieces, and boy, do people have opinions about adolescence, right? People have strong intuitions about what motivates adolescence. One of the things, for example, you will hear from professionals and other people is that adolescents believe they are immortal. Have you heard that ever? Adolescents, are, that's why they take crazy risks, exactly. It turns out that that's a myth that adolescents do not necessarily believe they're immortal. They're more, no more likely to believe they're immortal than adults are. And in fact, they perceive themselves to be at higher risk than adults. In a variety of different analyses and, and replications, this has been shown. So this is one of the ways in which things we assume to be true turn out not to be true when you look at the scientific research. So I'm very proud of that. Um, 
Uh, another thing, too, that's true about this book is we represented people with different points of view. So people are in this book back to back, sometimes in adjacent chapters, uncomfortably close to one another, who disagree vehemently with one another. Now, again, in both cases, you know, in all of these different cases, I asked people to deal with the evidence from the other side. But you will see things like, for example, one article by Vladimir Slutsky and Kaminsky are, talks about whether concrete examples are useful or not, or whether they're misleading. Slutsky has this very controversial view, but backed up by a lot of data, that concrete examples can be very limiting. That when you give concrete examples and you try to make everything situated cognition, you may have heard that phrase, make everything about a specific example, a specific context, that that does not necessarily help people think better, especially in areas of higher cognition, where you have to think abstractly and you have to generalize. Now, I'm going to give you kind of a silly example. It's the kind of example a little kid would probably generalize from. If you said, let me teach you addition, and we're going to talk about two apples plus three apples equals five apples, they might conclude that addition is something you do with apples. Right? So Slutsky is saying, especially for abstract hard things like mathematics, it's in fact sometimes better and you get better results when you use abstract symbolic notations and things, that there's actually better transfer and generalization of learning to new situations because you're not misled by concrete details that turn out to be unimportant. So this is a very important idea, but right in the chapter after his chapter, Someone disagrees. Someone from Stanford disagrees. Someone very smart who also has evidence on his side. And he points out that sometimes concrete examples are extremely important because they allow you to understand what's being talked about in generalities. So as often as the case in science, they both have a point. And in this case, they both have data. But it's very important if you want to understand how high school students or adolescents think to understand when is General, gen, when is generality good for learning, and when is generality bad for learning? And that's in this book. Uh, another thing we did that's very different, and this was a challenge, was to gather together people from very different kinds of disciplines. So neuroscientists, people in education, and people who are psychologists are all within this book, between the same two covers of this book. And they're talking. Uh, about a lot of the same concepts. But part of our mission here, my mission, and I should probably get to that, part of the aims of the book was to connect the basic science to the, the practice. So on the one hand, I wanted to identify in this very fast-moving area in which every three years or, go, or so we, we question our assumptions, um, what would be the implications? How can we fast-track the implications of science for real people with real issues? And as you know, adolescents have a lot of issues, and we're going to talk about that. Now, some of them are blissfully, happily, happy, doing well, and everything's fine. I don't want to pathologize adolescents. It's a normal part of life. But there's also tremendous potential and tremendous vulnerability in adolescence. It is a gateway to life, and for that reason, it's particularly important if you're interested in health, if you're interested in education, and if you're interested in public policy, which I am. All right, so um, one of the, the uh, themes that cross-cuts a lot of these chapters is, as you can tell from my examples, mathematics. So we could think about thinking and reasoning and, and processing information in many contexts, right? We could think about that in terms of social studies or history. All of that's very important. Mathematics, however, has been a particular challenge. The Foundations for Success, underlying Foundations for Success report, of the National Mathematics Panel well, was issued in 2008. I was a member of that panel, and I learned a lot on that panel. But one of the things I learned was how, you know, how much underachievement there is in mathematics. And if you look at the fourth grade level of achievement, and the eighth grade level of achievement, and the twelfth grade level of achievement, guess where the disparities are worst? Twelfth grade, where you think, okay, by then, young people have gotten whatever the concepts are. We even discovered that 12th graders about to go into the work world and about, or to college didn't know fractions. 
They didn't get fractions right. I mean, this is something that's taught in elementary school. Not only that, when algebra teachers were asked, what, what's standing in the way of kids getting algebra? And remember, algebra is a gateway to what? STEM careers, science, mathematics, technology, right? So you got to get algebra to get to that outcome. So when they were asked, what's missing? They said basic skills like fractions, that their students came into their class. This is adolescents, not little kids. Adolescents not knowing basic concepts like that. And as you can imagine, it has a tremendous impact on the, um, the life of the adolescent. So what about the brain? Let's talk a little background. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in our concepts of the adolescent brain. This is the brain that's going to do the math, the brain that's going to make a difference in the future of our country. So let's talk a little bit about it. And to a few years ago, the assumption was that the adolescent brain was pretty much developed at the onset of adolescence. But as you can tell from that uh, title there, massive changes in the adolescent brain. I know some of you have a little bit of trouble seeing the screen, perhaps, so I'll, I will try to read things. Um, this is um, uh, basically a compilation of over 2,000 scans of, of uh, brains, ranging from five years of age up here on the upper left all the way to 20 years of age. And this is uh, Jay Geed and his associates who actually wrote the first foundational chapter in the book. So he reviews all of this research on the anatomy of the adolescent brain and how it changes, how the brain changes from childhood to adulthood. It's a really nice chapter. And as you can see, if you look at this little metric on the right, it goes from a bluish color to a kind of reddish, kind of maybe dark purple color. And this is just the thickness. This is cortical thickness, how thick the brain is, gray matter in particular. And as you can see, something really startling happens as you get older you lose brain, right? So you have massive pruning of gray matter. No one predicted this. If they tell you they predicted it, they're lying. <laughs> no, we were stunned by this when these data just first came out. Why would you all of this matter be pruned away in, in the brain? And that's kind of a mystery, isn't it? And in fact, I know these are a little busy, but I'll walk you through them. Uh, mainly the point here is, is that there, there's th these graphs represent f the brain scans of 475 males over age. This goes from about 5 to about 20-something, um, and 354 females. Now, the darker lines are the males. So as you can see, the males have larger brains in some areas. Doesn't make them smarter, but they do have larger brains. Uh, and then you have the females. And as you can see, the, the gray matter, just as we saw in the colored pictures, goes up in early childhood. And then as adolescence comes, comes about, it starts to go down. The amount of gray matter actually decreases. And in this particular case, um, so this is overall gray matter, and it decreases for both males and females significantly. As you can see, by the age of 19, there's much less gray matter in the brain. What about white matter? Well, white matter actually increases in the brain, as you can see, over age. And again, like I say, this is 2,000 scans compiled together, looked at longitudinally. In other words, taking the same uh, young people and scanning them um, over time and seeing how their brains develop. So the, 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 the quick summary of this, and naturally you can read more in the book in detail, in gory detail, um, is that uh, the, the notion is that as a result of experience, the brain is remodeled to become more of an express superhighway as opposed to a local kind of route. It becomes much more efficient. Things that are not used are, are, are get, get uh, uh, lost and, and atrophy away. And then the things that are reinforced by experience become much more efficient. At the same time, connections in the brain, the white matter and so on, get much more efficient. You have this myelin or this fatty sheath that, that um, that is around axons that promotes the very fast and rapid transmission of, of nerve, uh, nerve impulses in the brain. So the picture you get is, a, it is, is more efficient information processing, more rapid inter, uh, information processing as a result of experience, which again is very, very different than the typical information processing theory, which tended to emphasize a lot of connection, a lot of thinking, a lot of elaboration as progress, that that was progress in thinking. This really is a picture of less is more. Less is more. All right. So why is the brain important? Well, you guys all know why the brain is important, but let's think about it for a minute, particularly for adolescents. It's a time in which young people have to resist a lot of temptations. There's a lot of ways in which the young person can have their education derailed. 
In this modern world that we live in, the number one reason for Latinas to drop out of high school is still unplanned pregnancy today in 2012. So there's also a knowledge-based economy. It's a globally competitive world. How do we stack up globally? Well, I encourage you to look at the PISA and the TIMS and other standardized tests and see how we stack up against the world. I think you'll be surprised. We're, we're not at the top, I hate to say it, especially our 12th graders. So how do we deal with all of these challenges? What makes us able to cope? Well, it's the remarkable capabilities of the human brain that allow us to cope with the world. Um, and this allows us to overcome challenges, and in particular, our ability to learn, to reason, and to decide. These higher cognitive functions are connected to healthy outcomes. So as you might imagine, higher cognition are those three things, and higher cognition in particular, as I've mentioned before, supports higher mathematics, things like even fractions turns out to be fairly high mathematics, and algebra. And higher cognition supports better decision making and strategic self-control. Now, if you look at the models of decision making, for example, they talk about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into this in a little bit more detail, how people can cognitively strategize in ways to deal with temptation. So how do you delay gratification? How do you um, study tonight instead of going to the party in order to do well tomorrow in your chosen career, in order to have a life and support your family? How do you do that? Do you just grin and bear it? You know, resist really hard? No, you engage in a lot of cognitive strategies to distract yourself and to, and to in fact, keep your goal in mind as you're trying to approach your goal, a goal that hasn't even arrived yet, that's in the future. So the book links, obviously, the recent neuroscience discoveries about the brain develops, but also it links it to how we teach young people and how we prepare them to make healthy life choices. And as I've shown you, there's substantial brain development, and this is a period of great promise and pitfalls. So one of the things I want to emphasize is that this initial trajectory in adolescence is very important. As you begin work, as you begin college, as you begin life, what you have is, as of late adolescence is your bank account that you draw on. Now I want to add though that it doesn't mean that your life trajectory is forever fixed based on however you, wherever you were at that point. That would be bad news for a lot of us, wouldn't it? Because we change significantly after that period. So these things can be changed and we have several chapters in the book that talk about training adolescents and educating adolescents in ways that actually change fluid intelligence. So IQ, which we think of as something inborn, can be changed by training executive processes in the brain. And the chapter on that particular thing is written by a very rigorous scientist, so he has data. So when we say that this trajectory has this, where you start off in life has a tremendous impact, it doesn't mean it can't be changed. And in fact, several chapters in the book talk about that. So, but what, what's at stake though, just to get a sense of this. Now these are economic estimates of some of the costs we face if we, we don't take advantage of the potential of the adolescent brain. Right now, the US Department of Transportation estimates that the cost of crashes involving drivers age 15 to 20 is $40.8 billion. Now, can we dispute those estimates? Absolutely. So maybe it's only $20 billion, right? But that's a lot of money and it's a lot of human suffering and lost potential. Uh, there's, if our students were to match the mathematics levels uh, and science levels of countries like Finland and Canada, there's an estimate by, by a well-known economist that it would benefit the US economy $100 trillion. So those are the kinds of stakes we're talking about. That's the potential. And by the way, I should say this book is only the first step. We don't solve all of these problems in this book. We really just begin the dialogue and we begin to compile what we know now and we're hoping that some of the people in this audience and some of the people out there in the world will build on this initial knowledge. But this is the scope of the problem that we deal with. Um, it's even the case that the, the cognitive um, resources that you build up in adolescence and young adulthood are drawn down when you get into aging so that one of the best investments you can make in staving off cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, in staving it off and delaying the onset of it, is education and using your brain. And, and that ability to build that up young and then draw on that for the rest of your life is actually a protective factor in cognitive impairment. So what is the mystery of adolescence, especially with respect to reasoning and higher cognition? 
if you look at the data, it sort of is like a tale of two cities, right? On the one hand, it was the best of times, but it's the worst of times, adolescence, in other ways. It was the age of wisdom, but it's also the age of foolishness, adolescence. So it's kind of a tale of two brains, with apologies to Dickens. Okay, so what about the best of times? Well, if you look at measures of reaction time, adolescents and young adults, they're the fastest. That's the best you're gonna be in your life, right? Motor kinds of things. Uh, you're at your physical peak, and you score very high, if especially we talk about later adolescence and young adulthood, on memory and reasoning tests. So in the laboratory, you're a genius. All right? You're a genius at reasoning and thinking and judgment and decision making. All right? So let's take a look at the data. Now this, is a, this is a little bit of illustrative data just to whet your appetite uh, from one of the chapters in the book by Sandy Chapman and her colleagues. And she's the director of the Center for Brain Health in Dallas. So you can see on the left, some of you can see on the left, uh, <laughs> that here's me memory from seven or eight years of age all the way up to age 15. That's the last bar. And on the left, we have memory for facts. So if you just, when you study your textbook in school, do you remember what was said in the textbook verbatim, right? And in this particular sample, there's not a whole lot of development between the younger ages and the older ages in fact memory. If you get very subtle kinds of measures, you can show development there. But for the purpose of, of our um, discussion now, what's key is that the 15-year-old, either the, the, this is an ADHD, sample of 43 and a typical or actually high performing set of 15 year old adolescents. And as you can see, they do pretty well on number correct. If you look over here at just reasoning, there's even more developmental difference. This is getting the implications that are not literal, right? This is going beyond the facts in the, in the social studies textbook or in the math textbook to get what's the underlying implication or meaning. And that just based uh, ability to make inferences goes up sharply with age, but then it plateaus in adolescence. So the ability to reason, you're tippy top. The ability to remember, you're tippy top. Your ability to make decisions, you're tippy top. So what's wrong with this picture, right? Oh, and I should tell you too, these are pictures of the brain. Now this is again, very preliminary data, but I wanted to show you this because it's kind of exciting. Actual pictures of the human brain, these same um, kids we were just talking about, their data, their performance, this is their brains. And this is compared to baseline, the areas of the brain that activate differentially for just reasoning. When you're reasoning about gist, you're making inferences, these are the parts of your brain that light up. And in particular, you can see frontal areas lighting up, which makes sense. These are advanced areas of the brain. Down here, this is when you're retrieving these fact memories. And as you can see in this particular study, parietal areas of the brain lit up when you're retrieving these facts. So your brain is working hard at facts, your brain is working hard at, at inferences and reasoning, and, um, and this develops with age. And we can actually, with magnetic resonance imaging, and this is functional magnetic resonance imaging, we can reach inside the living brain and actually see it, take pictures of it, as it works, as it solves these problems. So this gives us insight uh, into mechanism, into how the brain is actually functioning to produce that good inference that, uh, that helps a young person score high on achievement tests, helps a young person become an engineer who can solve complex problems, helps a young person solve problems in life and think about um, and able to use their potential. So Chapman's results are echoed in another chapter in the book, and I'm sort of going to give you a quick tour of, of different chapters in the book. I can't really do them justice, but I'm going to try to do a little bit of justice to them. Um, McCray et al. talk about how there's a lot of development, again, in adolescence in the nature of what's called the mental lexicon. This is our mental dictionary of word meanings. Now you would think, kids learn words when? Like when they're two, right? So what could be happening in adolescence in terms of how we organize conceptual knowledge about words? Turns out a lot changes in adolescence. It goes to a massively organized by conceptual meaning, it's kind of organizational structure. And this is a big, big change from early on. And you get all kinds of paradoxical effects as a result of this. Greater what's called false memory, or phantom recollection as a result of this, where things that are consistent with the meaning of events are more likely to be said, yes, I, I experienced that directly. When you get older, this is a kind of paradox, right? And so, so you get less accurate 
when you get older because you're more conceptually driven. This is fascinating, and there's probably good reasons why people change in that way, but the, there's a lot of recent evidence that shows much more change happening at, at that point in, in the brain. So do concrete examples help or hurt? I've just talked about that. Is addition about apples, right? Or can you apply it to oranges, too? Right? Uh, the late development of mathematical truth or necessity versus induction. Now, this is a wonderful chapter by Knuth, who is, who's one of these experts in math education. And he, he fascinated us at a conference before this book was written, talking about what middle school students don't know. So think about a fairly simple math situation or a math proof. How can you prove that adding any three numbers together gives an answer that's always odd? Think about it for a minute. Seems true, doesn't it? You can probably think of all kinds of examples of three, any three numbers taken. You add them together, and golly gee, they all turn out the sum is odd, isn't it? Hmm, why does that work that way? It turns out when you ask kids, middle school students, high school students, to say why that's true, they can't do it. I'm not sure I can do it either. <laughs> it seems like a hard problem, doesn't it? Um, and yet, this is what's required to do mathematical proofs in high school to get into the engineering and the science and all of that. So he studied um, what's easy and what's hard in, in adolescence, and that's remarkably difficult. And then finally, Jared Confrey talks about the conceptual knowledge of fractions as equal partitioning. How this very simple, simple idea, you think of a pie, you divide it up, you know, into equal partitions, now you have fractions, why is that so hard, right? It turns out, again, that this is not acquired until adolescence or adulthood, and most adults in nationally representative samples have trouble with fractions. And this ramifies to, real, to actually important life outcomes. So for example, lack of ability to do that has been linked to, to poor medical outcomes, poor medical adherence, inability to give a dose of medication to your child if you have to figure out the dose, if you have to multiply and divide by their body weight. That turns out to be difficult for millions and millions of Americans. So we think math is important, obviously. Um, the other, uh, another theme of the book is this notion of intellectual malleability, that these higher cognitive processes can be changed. And I mentioned um, before this Atkins et al. paper um, about adaptive cognitive training, where fluid intelligence can actually be improved by training working memory capacity and training the components of intelligence. So that's very exciting. But also there are other barriers to performance in high school math and in high school higher cognition. And that includes things like math anxiety and stereotype threat. So I don't know, many of us have math anxiety, right? I have trouble doing math on the board, for example. I like to work my examples out completely in, in advance because, you know, I feel anxious. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show the students the wrong, the wrong number. So a lot of us have math anxiety, uh, especially sometimes people who feel that by virtue of stereotypes that members of their group are not good in math. I don't know if anybody remembers the old Barbie where you pull the string on Barbie, on Barbie and what did Barbie say? Math is hard. <laughs> really? <laughs> Millions of young girls <laughs> heard math is hard out of the mouth of Barbie. This was not good, all right? This was definitely not good. I know, it seems amazing, isn't it? Um, but it's true. Uh, so and I'm sure they've changed that, Mattel. Anyway, um, so math anxiety is another thing that af affects standardized math performance. But what science has shown is that you can intervene, you can reduce math anxiety with simple, very cost-effective kinds of interventions that have evidence behind them. Stereotype threat, when you think, well, girls can't do math. Girls can do math, by the way. Um, uh, that those things can be changed with simple interventions that, again, are cost-effective, that can be implemented by high school teachers, have been implemented by high school teachers in experiments. The data have been shown. They've been published in science. And actual math achievement scores were altered. So there's a tremendous potential here, I think, for intellectual malleability. Also, a number of the chapters in the book talk about special populations. So I've already presented something about, you know, um, ADHD folks. Um, also, there are people talk about dyslexia and other kinds of, of not typically developing um, uh, populations. There are some circumstances and with some populations like folks with Asperger's and, and on the spectrum in autism actually score higher in certain kinds of reasoning and decision-making problems. And I'll leave that as kind of a, a teaser for you if you read the book. So, or you can ask me about it later too. 
Now, that was the good side, right? This is this mostly advanced, incredibly impressive, reasoning, decision-making genius in the lab. And then there's real life, right? So in real life, we have, and you know, know about all this, if you've ever had to buy car insurance for a young driver, right? The actuaries will tell you, pay extra. Why? Because the young driver maybe doesn't have as good judgment and decision-making skills as the experienced driver. So auto, auto accidents are the leading cause of death of folks between the age of 15 and 20. Some of that is just number of miles you've drive. But when you factor that out, there's a huge residual that has to do with making very poor choices. Speeding, reckless driving, doing crazy things, getting into cars with people who've been drinking. There's all kinds of things you'd say, wait a minute, what happened to all that genius reasoning, right? Uh, 9.1 million cases of STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, among young people. They tend not to use, when they engage in sex, they tend not to use uh, contraception as reliably, consistently, and correctly as older people do. And I could go on and on with many, many slides of all of the examples of poor judgment during this period. Okay. So the question is, does this look like advanced cognitive competence to you? <laughs> Probably not, right? Um, so what are the solutions to this mystery? Well, one of the solutions, the mystery is, on the one hand, they're smart at reasoning in the lab. On the other hand, the reasoning, decision making in the real world seems to be kind of dumb, right? So how can they be smart and dumb at the same time? Well, there's the effects of social, emotional, and motivational factors on cognition. That, of course, is one approach. And the, and the brain has really been um, part of the story of imbalance between emotion and, and cognition. And the notion is that dopaminergic parts of the brain, the parts of the brain that have to do with reward and sensitivity to reward uh, and emotion and so on, uh, get uh, ahead in development a bit before the cognitive control mechanisms come online in the prefrontal cortex and so on. So the accelerator is being pushed, but the brake is not quite assembled yet. All right. So then there, but there's, that's not the only answer to this conundrum of the mystery of adolescence. There are other answers. One of them is by uh, Stanovich, West, and Toplak. Now, this group is probably the number one the scientist on intelligence in the world. These are the people who are the experts on intelligence, and they wrote a chapter for this. And they argue that intelligence is not the same as rationality. You can be irrational and very smart, and so on and so forth. And they have evidence to support that thesis. That's a little different argument than the one above. Atkins et al. argue, on the contrary, that intelligence is adaptive, and in fact, intelligence is linked to better life outcomes in terms of making good choices, like emotional choices. That in fact, you have higher well-being. And there are papers that have been published that show a connection between the ability to use your intelligence adaptively to cope to have better, less, health, less unhealthy risk-taking and better outcomes. So, that, so Atkins, in fact, disagrees with Stanovich at all. So once again, we have in, the same, in this book people who disagree with each other. But part of that also is that this is so much on the cutting edge. This is not settled science yet, right? The, the work on the brain is only a few years old, really. Um, it's only maybe a decade or so that we've had most of the work that I'm talking about on the human brain, a little bit more than that. And then finally, there's people like uh, Christina Chick and myself who argue that some of these um, mysteries can be solved by separating a kind of cost-benefit verbatim-based analysis from a bottom-line gist-based analysis. And that that kind of thinking changes. When you go from adolescence to adult, you become more gist-based, more bottom-line. You get to the qualitative, categorical, bottom-line of things more quickly, more efficiently. You don't tote up the, the costs and benefits and say, you know, if I drove really fast, the probabilities are I could beat that train. <laughs> Instead, you say, wait it out, let it go by, it's not worth it, right? So that kind of thinking plus impulsivity also uh, decreases with age in this age group. So the, the standard theoretical curve that's shown, if this is uh, age here and this is where adolescence is, you have these subcortical emotion kinds of areas developing more rapidly earlier in life. You have these prefrontal regions slower to develop. The idea is there's this gap where reward is attracting you, but your cognitive control is insufficient to compensate. Now, that's a theoretical curve. What about real data, like with real kids? Well, in fact, we, sound, we found something that was pretty consistent with that. If you look at this, um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, dashed line here, this is behavioral inhibition, the ability to, 
to control yourself, to inhibit your behavior. And as you can see, there's a, a very kind of shallow but linear trend of increase over age from 14 to 21 in this study. So the ability to control yourself and to be sensitive to negative consequences, right? That is part of what that's measured, and that increases with age, right? But as you can see, though, sensation seeking goes up significantly, and then it comes down. So this is your reward sensitivity, your, your how much of a jolt of pleasure you get out of doing whatever that fun thing is. So that jolt of pleasure, of pleasure actually goes up with age and adolescence, and then it comes back down. And as you can see, this is where behavior happens. It's the difference between the ability to inhibit yourself and the ability, this is sort of avoidance and approach, right? So it's when those separate so that you can now control your urges because your urges are less intense that you begin to get that self-control and that more mature behavior. So that's broadly consistent with the, the theoretical curve. Now I have to show you pictures of brains. It's required, right? So, so I, don't worry, there won't be a quiz on this later or anything, but I just wanted to show you that this, this um, reward, and this is a chapter by Adriana Galvan in the book in which she maps out how the, the initial reward areas uh, in the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area then project out all over the brain in this nopaminergic uh, network of reward. So your whole brain is in thrall when you're getting rewards. It's not just one little tiny area like the nucleus accumbens that just activates and that's it. It's sending out projections and sending out chemicals all over the brain. So you can see what challenge the adolescent faces here. Um, this is some detailed data, and I'm, I'm running sort of low on time, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to just very quickly summarize. The, the gray areas here are adolescents. So this is younger kids on the left and adults on the right. And this is activation in the amygdala to facial expressions of emotion. And as you can see, adolescents, on average, are more reactive to emotion. Their amygdala lights up more in response to emotional faces. Over here, this is this reward uh, center, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral striatum. And as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of variability. But on average, that's more responsive to rewards. But note all the individual variation. Hopefully, your teenager is on the low end. Anyway. Um, what about the stop system? That was the go system. The reward is go, go for it, right? The stop system is the brakes. So if you look at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex here on the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, especially the, low, the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has been implicated in a lot of things that involve self-control. If you turn that part of the brain off through what's called transmagnetic cranial stimulation, you can just, it doesn't hurt. And it's not permanent, I swear. It just temporarily takes it offline. Then young people become <laughs> young people become much less able to delay gratification. So if I were to say to you, I'll call on you. If I were going to give you hundred dollars today or two hundred dollars in a week, would you wait? He wouldn't wait. This is called <laughs> a high discount rate. Or what if I said you were going to get three hundred dollars in a week? He'd wait then, all right? So now if we vary the amount you're willing to wait and how much you'll wait for, we can calculate a discount rate for you. And that's how much willing you are to wait to get more. A lot of life boils down to, I hate to say it, a lot of life boils down to the ability to wait to get more, right? He knows that. He knows in his heart it's true. <laughs> your discount rate isn't sure, but <laughs> all right. So if we take, uh, and we were to take your brain and, and um, take this part of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and deactivate it for a moment, now you can't wait. Now you've got to have that $100 now, even if I'm going to give you $300 later or $400, you've got to have it now. It deactivates that inhibition. All right. Thank you for participating. <laughs> Um, the white matter and it connects the stop to the go system. This changes significantly during adolescence. So the connection between the, you know, the one part of the brain that generates the impulses and the part that applies the brakes, those connections get stronger and faster and better. So that makes sense. That's called the frontostriatal pathway. And it leads to better impulse control. This part that you know, inhibits gets connected to the part that wants things and is able to um, uh, inhibit those. So that develops during adolescence as well. So what's the sort of bottom line here? We have an epilogue at the end in which we talk about some lessons that emerge as a result of this very new research. One of them is that adolescents have almost a hyper-rationality. They're almost too logical sometimes, and they miss the forest for the trees. And this ironically leads them to take more risks. 
Because if you think about it, many risks that we teach about in health class are low probability risks. So what is the probability of getting HIV from a single unprotected sexual encounter? Don't tell anyone, but it's low, right? It's actually low. So if you think purely logical and you're calculating benefits and costs, the benefits loom large if you're a teenager of having sex. I don't think that news is going to be made here with that statement. But, <laughs> but in fact, and the, and the probabilities are low. So if you're hyper-rational, you might take risks that an adult would view as completely crazy to do. Why would you take such a risk? It's the categorical possibility that's the problem. All right? That's how, why we think with JIS. So there's an acting with too much thinking and acting without thinking. And both of these kinds of, of, of mental operations lead to risk taking, but qualitatively different kinds of risk taking with qualitatively different programs to help the young person. If it's just a question of impulsivity and not thinking ahead, that's one set of remedies. If it's they're thinking too much and they're coldly calculating, taking a risk, that's a very different remedy for that kind of issue. right? Uh, there's also developmental changes, as, as I've shown you, in the relation between emotion and higher cognition, um, which range from mathematics anxiety to unhealthy habits, and these can be changed. And the bottom line is the way that youth learn, reason, and decide changes developmentally during adolescence a lot, and it also can be changed. So before I close, I wanted to briefly show you a picture of our, our new magnet that's going to be situated here at Cornell. This is Coming Attractions. Uh, we want to build on the work in that book and in many, many other people's articles. And uh, we will be scanning brains using non-ionizing radiation. This is non-ionizing right here at Cornell, and we're very excited about it. This is our GE Cigna 3 Tesla machine, which will be right in Martha Van Rensselaer Hall. Um, we can study the living, functioning human brain as the brain thinks as the brain learns, as the brain makes decisions, and we can study that developmentally. And we're very excited about this new tool. Uh, we view it really as, you know, like the telescope or the microscope, which really changed science. It was just a tool, right? It didn't give you ideas, but it made possible the ability to study ideas that you couldn't study without that tool. And thanks to the good work of the dean and, and Kay Orbendorf and many other people who were so helpful, we're now able to do that, including Yi Wang, our wonderful MR physicist. So in closing, I want to remember who we're thinking about here. We're thinking about young people and their lives and their life trajectories. And this is what really matters in the end. We think about the 15-year-old who was homeless and then two years later was at Harvard. We think about the 17-year-old high school dropout who became the US Surgeon General. Uh, he was embarked on a life of crime right up until he discovered someone who made a difference, and he ended up um, an emergency medicine doctor and U.S. Surgeon General, so in a very in inauspicious beginning. So there's hope. There are pitfalls, but there's tremendous potential at this part of life, tremendous malleability at this part of life. Um, and we think a lot of it really comes down to the power of the human brain and harnessing that power and potential of the human brain to engage in these higher cognitive functions. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming and just the people that made this book possible, not only the National Science Foundation, the editors and the authors, but in particular, I want to thank Kareem Booker, without whom this book would never have been completed, who was there at every step of the way with me, uh, the American Psychological Association, who published it, the great people of the Mann Library, who've been so helpful, and to you. Thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.